connection between female beauty and male infatuation is one of the most regular sequences of cause and effect observable in everyday life. E.H. Carr, What is History? Hello and welcome back. Sancho now unleashes a string of refrains about a woman's fickle nature. Between the yes and no of a woman, I would not dare to place the point of a needle. Love, according to what I have heard, gazes with such desire that it makes copper look like gold, poverty like wealth, and mucus like pearls. Note subjective value theory again, and just like in the first part of Don Quixote, the theme of monetary policy now parallels the theme of adultery. Also, Sancho seems to have experienced the infidelity of his own wife. Monetary and domestic problems mix when Don Quixote gets annoyed by Sancho's abuse of refrains, and Sancho, in turn, gets mad at Don Quixote's interventions. Your grace, my lord, is always so friscal with my sayings and even my deeds. Don Quixote corrects him. Fiscal, you mean to say. Sancho now becomes roundly impertinent. I did not grow up at court, nor did I study at Salamanca, claiming that even some people from Almighty Toledo are not so sharp. Now the student intervenes in Don Quixote and Sancho's dispute. First, he specifies that he is a licentiate. Then he defends Sancho's liberal approach to language. His words recall the marketplace of Don Quixote Part 1, Chapter 9. Those who grow up in Tanerias and in the Socodover can't speak as well as those who spend most of their days strolling about the cloister of the main cathedral, and yet they're all Toledans. Did you know Salamanca and Toledo, respectively, are the departure point and the final destination of Lazario de Tormes, the first modern picaresque novel? The marginal words of the tannery and the marketplace also echo Rojas' La Celestina. And there are hints of the picaresque when the student ironically brags about his own education. I'm cocky enough, pico me algún tanto, to speak my thoughts with clear, plain, and meaningful words. Now the other student confronts his friend, telling him that if he were to have paid more attention to rhetoric than to fencing, then he would have graduated first instead of last. The licentiate responds that the bachelor is wrong about fencing. Now we know the respective statuses of the two students, and the narrator's previous uncertainty regarding their statuses has now been clarified by their dialogue. Note also that the narrator suddenly calls the bachelor by his name, Corchuelo. This happens out of the blue. The other student has not called him Corchuelo, and the narrator does not explain. Here, Cervantes tells us something about his own art, which involves precision and the illusion of naturalness, and sometimes even the illusion of mistakes. Corchuelo now challenges the licentiate to a fencing duel. Reworking the duel between the Knight of the Mirrors and Don Quixote, fencing becomes the focus of the remainder of the chapter. And this is an intellectual duel as well as a physical one. Even though he claims intellectual superiority over his friend, Corchuelo is still just a bachelor, not a licentiate. Corchuelo thinks fencing is a waste, mocking its status as a mathematical science. Pivot about your compass, deploy your circles, your angles, and your science, for I plan on making you see stars at noon. The others can only watch as the mortal tragedy unfolds. Whose tragedy? What are the academic levels of Corchuelo and his colleague? A, doctoral student and master's student. B, licentiate and bachelor. C, professor and teaching assistant. Correct answer, B, licentiate and bachelor. Cervantes describes the fencing duel with beautiful cinematography. The way the licentiate defeats the bachelor is comical. Corchuelo delivers a variety of strokes, infinite in number, and attacks like an irritated lion. But he gets nowhere. The licentiate then makes a fool of him, marking and shredding his clothes. He accounted with stabs for all the buttons of the short 
cassock that he was wearing, turning its back part into the tails of an octopus. By the way, stringing together the tails of an octopus is a metaphor for the art of writing in Cervantes' picaresque novella, The Colloquy of the Dogs. After the licentiate twice knocks Corchuelo's hat off his head, the bachelor gives up. But his final gesture of surrender is both impressive and symbolic. Rabid, angry, and spiteful, the bachelor seized his sword by the hilt and hurled it into the air with such force that one of the farmers standing by, who was also a notary and went looking for it, later attested that he threw it almost three and a half leagues away. Given this demonstration of Corchuelo's strength, the moral expressed by the narrator is explicit and paradoxically ambivalent because it favors intelligence over strength, but also surrender over victory. Which testimony serves and has served to confirm and illustrate in all truth how force is overcome by art? Hilariously, Sancho suggests that Corchuelo should not challenge anyone to fencing, but rather to a throwing contest. Corchuelo's response is that he has learned humility, which clarifies the narrator's previous paradox. I'm content to have fallen off my she-ass and to have been presented by experience with the truth from which I was so far removed. Now Corchuelo makes an amazing gesture, one we almost never see in Don Quixote. And standing up, he embraced the licentiate and they remained better friends than before. Finally, we get another reference to mathematics when the licentiate makes another speech in defense of the art of fencing. With such demonstrative logic and so many figures and mathematical proofs that all were made to see the righteousness of that science and Corchuelo was converted from his obstinacy. The last two terms indicate that Cervantes is again mocking the Inquisition, which converted its victims from the obstinacy of their heresy. The irony is that the Inquisition is a horrific science. There are better ways to demonstrate moral truth, such as writing or avoiding violence. Our travelers now arrive at the site of the wedding. They arrive at night, but there is light everywhere. The scene is a sky filled with innumerable and resplendent stars, all complemented by the music of diverse instruments. Then we learn that the trees at the entrance to the village were filled with holiday lights. Note that joy and tranquility reign. That's all for now. Be sure and watch our next video. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.